Why am I mic'd up? This is a Panasonic. It's your show. You do your motion picture magic, whatever. No, no, no. This is the Panasonic G9 II. It's a camera for photographers, Chris. What? Finally! But I've been talking about Panasonic, uh, ignoring photographers for so long now. Really? Welcome back to Petapixel. It is Chris Nichols here, and Jordan and I are on another Southern Alberta road trip to play with this very exciting camera. Yes, it is indeed the Panasonic G9 version 2 made for photographers. What? Now, the Panasonic G92s that we have today are final hardware, but they're not final firmware. So we can test a lot, but I am going to stop just short of calling this a final review. That being said, we are going to test a lot and give you a lot of good information today. But I think in the future, we'll take a second look at this camera, especially compared to maybe one of its new contemporary counterparts, like the OM System OM1, for example. So I want to point something out here. This uses a 25 megapixel micro four thirds non-stacked sensor, which is very similar. I'm not going to say it's the same. It's probably based off or similar, who knows, but very similar to the Panasonic GH6. And the GH6 was a remarkably good video camera, but actually had a fatal flaw when it came to photography. And that strange quirk was this. When you shot from 100 up to, but not including 800 ISO, you got terrible dynamic range. It was really odd. Once you got to 800 ISO and above, it basically was on par with its contemporary cameras. But below that, you were just really getting terrible dynamic range. So then we were worried, well, with this camera, we're going to have the same issue. Well, we're going to talk about that just in a bit when we get into image quality, but you're going to stick around for that. Now, I should also point out that Jordan is also shooting a Panasonic G9 II today. In fact, he also shot our previous Sigma 100 to 400 video review on the G9 II, but he called it an S52X because he's a liar. He's just a bald faced liar. And he lied to you directly in your homes where you are sitting in your chair. Anyways, so he's been filming that episode handheld without using digital stabilization. Today, he's shooting handheld with the stabilization turned on. So have a look out for that, see how stable it is. And we do have a really cool trip because we're gonna go to a National Historic Site, Bar U Ranch, haven't been there since COVID. There's lots of interesting photo opportunities to test out. All right, so we had a lovely time at Bar U Ranch next to the crystal clear waters of the Pekisco, which I haven't fished in a long time, I miss it. But now we find ourselves next to the beautiful Sheep River here, continuing our road trip. So when it comes to handling, the first thing I notice is the same kind of body design as the Panasonic S5 II, but with some small changes. First off, we do have an additional custom button next to the lens mount. That's nice. But another change is interesting, something that's been omitted. There's no fan. Now the S5 II had a very nondescript fan built into the body. It's no bigger or smaller. It's the same outer dimensions. And that fan would prevent a lot of overheating issues in video recording. But when Panasonic made this strictly for photographers, they asked those photographers, do you want a fan? It's not really gonna impact your photos in any way. It's not a bad thing. And the photographer's like, hell no, a pox on your house. I'll murder your whole family. I'll set things on fire, whatever, if you put a fan in the camera. So Panasonic relented, hence no fan. You'll notice even the vent hole all sealed up. Otherwise it handles very similar to an S5 II. I mean, it's a nice body design. I like the look of it. The grip is not the most comfortable, but it's fine. I love the white balance ISO and exposure comp. I will say though, I still wish that this mode dial had a locking button on it. It doesn't have that. And the dials on top here are rather easy to change. Now for photo, I didn't really find that to be an issue, but I know for Jordan shooting video on this camera, he was constantly changing the shutter angle without wanting to. But otherwise it's a very functional body, but it's quite a bit different than the original G9. I mean, that had a very unique unique kind of race car look to it. It had really nice handling controls, beautifully magnified EVF, and it did have a locking switch on the mode dial. So it's kind of funny that we don't have that. Now the G9 had twin SD card slots. This also has twin SD card slots, both UHS two speed, which is nice. 
Interestingly enough, I mean, again, because maybe this camera is intended for photographers, it does not have the CF Express port that was useful in the GH6 for high-end video recording and the data rates that were encountered there. Is that going to impact your video on this camera? Stay tuned, Jordan will let you know. Weight-wise, we're just around 680 grams. It's basically a third of a knock. Uh, it does have a nice feel to it. The body has been ruggedized. Now, Panasonic says this is freeze-proof. And the last thing I want to point out, we still have the same Panasonic BLK22 battery. We've seen this in the S5 II. We're getting about 390 separated shots, which is not great. But remember, in real-life terms, practical terms, you're going to get way more than 390 shots before the battery conks out. Now, the G9 original camera had a really nice 3.69 million dot EVF with really good magnification. It's been a long time since I've looked through one, so I can't necessarily remember or compare it to this one. This is also a 3.69 million dot EVF. It's very good. I mean, it's fine. It's the same one that we have in the Panasonic S5 II. We also have the same fully articulating screen as the Panasonic S5 II and the G9, which I'm fine with, but honestly, I feel like photographers prefer having the tilt function as well without having to extend the screen off from the body. And that tilt function is oddly found on the Panasonic GH6, which is more of a video-centric camera. So it's kind of funny we don't have it here. I think they're just trying to keep it exactly the same as S5 II. Otherwise, though, it's a 1.84 million dot back panel. It's bright. I still find the articulation useful for lots of kinds of photography. There you go. We're going to do a walk and talk, put the IBIS to the test because it's an improved system now on the G9 version 2. The IBIS has been upscaled to eight stops of stabilization. Panasonic's basically saying like this is the best they've ever done. And it puts it now on par with the OM system cameras, which up to this point have been the gold standard. And I'm certainly noticing it being far more stable when shooting pictures today. All right, so now we're in the beautiful, cute little town of, well, we'll talk about the name because really it's an interesting story. There was two small towns, Turner Valley and Black Diamond. You know, they struck oil back in the day. It was a really big thing. Anyways, they've decided to amalgamate into one township and they were trying to figure out the name combining the two. And they're like, do we call it Turner Diamond? Do we call it Black Valley? Now it's Diamond Valley. So we're now in the town of Diamond Valley, but I mean, everything still says Turner Valley because that was his name for, you know, forever. Oh, sorry, okay, where was I? Uh, let's talk about Burr Strait. So first off, it with a mechanical shutter, 10 frames per second on this camera. That's with autofocus and control. Now, if you go to electronic shutter, that goes up to a staggering 60 frames per second with autofocus, 75 frames per second if you don't need autofocus. Now, keep in mind as well that although this is not a stack sensor, it reads out at around a hundredth of a second. That's not bad. So the electronic shutter is usable. You're not gonna get too much rolling shutter. Now, we tested this and in raw only, shooting 60 frames per second, we were going to get this way, Jordan, you're gonna crash. We were we're gonna get about three seconds of shooting, around 200 shots. That's a pretty impressive buffer. So if I'm shooting at 10 frames per second mechanical, it's just gonna go and go and go for pretty much ever this way, Jordan. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out is this does have the excellent pre-burst mode that we've used before for wildlife. This is where you could just pre-buffer a shot, waiting for a moment. I got a butterfly here, it takes off. My timing doesn't have to be good. I just touch the shutter and I can have the camera record either half a second, a full second, or one and a half seconds before and after the point that I touch the shutter. And that's gonna be at 60 frames per second even with electronic shutter autofocusing. So it's actually a really useful way to capture that decisive moment. Now the original G9 made small strides into computational photographic capabilities. It had a multi-shot mode with motion correction, you know, like leaves blowing in the wind and stuff, but you had to use it on a tripod. The G9 II now has a much more upgraded system, very much like the GH6. You've got their handheld high-res multi-shot mode. Basically, you can set the camera up, hand hold it, take shots, it does a whole bunch and compiles them together, and you can get up to 100 megapixel files, and the detail improvement is absolutely noticeable. On top of that, you get better noise performance, so, you know, just overall a nicer image, and you don't even need to use a tripod for that. Now, of course, you put it on a tripod, you'll just eliminate handheld instability altogether, and that'll give you even better results, that's great. We also have the live composite mode that's carried over from a lot of other Panasonic cameras, and this is a neat sort of like night photography shot mode where, Basically, the camera will, again, take multiple shots and compile them, but it will take some shots and then get the highlighted areas, the brighter areas exposed properly, and then basically leave them there. And that's kind of like a neat HDR kind of mode, especially for low light photography, it's very handy. I still do want to say, though, that the OM system, OM1, still takes the cake when it comes to that sort of computational magic 
trickery because it has still neat functions like the live bulb mode where you can do a bulb setting and you just watch the exposure build up and when it's good you let go that's really nice takes a lot of the guesswork out and it's got the excellent live nd capability where you can mimic long exposure times without having to use a tripod or nd filters we still don't have anything like that here all right so we're walking to our next location but we're not going to cut or anything you're going to watch us walk there so while we're walking together, why don't we just talk about subscribing to the channel? If you haven't done it already, this is a great time. Click subscribe, only click it once. Don't click it again. Make sure it's highlighted, otherwise you'll unsubscribe just the one time. And then make sure the bell's lit up too, okay? Because then you'll get all the notifications for all our cool videos. You know, we review cameras, we always talk about color profile modes for JPEGs, you know, especially Fujifilm. We're talking about all their film simulation modes, but I don't think we've ever talked about the Panasonic color profiles for JPEG, and we still won't, except for one mode, though. This now has a brand new mode, Leica Monochrome, and I love it. I'm going to shoot it. You're going to get so many samples. In fact, I only wanted to shoot that, and it's only because Jordan whined that you guys are even getting any color photography today, because I would happily shoot in the Leica Monochrome. Look at it. It's beautiful. All right, Jordan, drive me. Next place. All right, well, he didn't get very far. We got sucked in by Eau Claire Distillery. Go figure. That's kind of a running thing for us. But hey, we're here and we're going to talk now about autofocus because the G92 is technically the third camera to get the new phase detect hybrid autofocusing system, the S52 and then the S52X. So really, let's call it the second. And this does have now the advanced autofocusing algorithm. So we still have eye detect. Oddly enough, though, this eye detect is still using the old school big box around a person's face with the crosshair, which I find really distracting. But it now also has animal eye detect. We've been testing that out quite a bit today. And as you can see here, it's actually been working very well. You know, puppies, roosters, horses, it did a really good job. And it's giving you just the small green box around the actual eye rather than that crazy thing for portraits. Now we also get other subject detection modes. We get now motorcycles and cars as well. So you have that for motorsports. So really the G92 has a pretty full featured subject detection mode. And uh, we're finding the hit rate for autofocus is actually very good. It's tracking pretty well. You know, we are still having some issues there, but let's keep in mind that we don't have final firmware. So until we can really judge a full review copy, we don't want to make any blanket statements there. But overall, the autofocus experience has been quite good. Now I did take a lot of samples today. I do want to talk about image quality, but at the same time, I just got raw software I want to get home put them through their paces really check some stuff confirm some findings so we're gonna do a little bit of time traveling but because of the magic of video editing you won't even notice let's get to it welcome back it is future Chris here we've had a chance to take a look at the files between the G92 and the GH6 and just to recap this is a problem we found on the GH6 it's a great video camera but up to, but not including 800 ISO, we found the dynamic range was quite poor you couldn't push shadows you get a lot of noise it was very strange now from 800 and above, it was absolutely fantastic. It was very comparable to modern contemporary Micro Four Thirds cameras. It was just something about the lower ISOs where it was lacking, and that was a real problem for photographers. Now, I should say, there isn't really any final software yet to edit these RAW files, but we did put the RAW files through in-camera conversion in the G92 and the GH6. As you can see here, same shot, same settings. And what we did find is the G92 does, at those lower ISOs, have better dynamic range, better ability to push shadows, less color noise, less noise in general. And this is a very promising thing for us, a very hopeful thing, because we were so kind of disappointed with what the GH6 did at lower ISOs. And if this camera, the G92, is going to be made for photographers, it has to have better performance. And we definitely want to test this when we get final software that supports it and a reviewable camera. But... Fingers crossed it looks good. All right, let's talk about video capabilities of the G92. And initially I didn't really have my hopes high. Panasonic was very clear. This is not a camera specifically for video. Jordan, you're gonna be disappointed. And then they kept talking about the features on it. And it basically had everything that was already offered in the GH6. There are some record modes that you can't record to the SD card, but this still allows you to output to an external SSD through the USB port. So you've still got access to all those super high data rate files. So it was pretty compelling that we've got all those same GH6 features, but this actually offers some stuff you won't even find in their premium Micro Four Thirds video body. For starters, we've got the phase detect autofocus that Chris has already talked about, and I love using this on the S52, S52X. It actually performs a little better here, probably because of the faster readout. But the other thing is, we had some real issues where you got the dynamic range boost mode in the GH6, which gave it very good dynamic range, but it was, it was at 2000 ISO, so I had to use a lot of ND filters to take advantage of it. Now, if you're shooting log, your native is 500. So I was concerned, like what are the compromises in order to do that? 
but looking at this camera against the GH6, first of all, shooting at base, 500 ISO, you can see we've got quite a bit more dynamic range in the G9 Mark II. But also, if we look at 2000 ISO with dynamic range boost turned on on the GH6, we're getting very similar noise levels between the two bodies, so there's no real downside to the new way that they're implementing that dual gain architecture. It's really smart, and I'm very impressed by it. Okay, so the IBIS is more effective for stills, but what about for video? Well, it is very stable in this, but if you're using ultra-wide lenses, we're starting to see the effect that you do run into, especially with Canon cameras, where you get some wobble at the edges, and it's an optical phenomenon. What's really interesting is, if you turn on the digital stabilization on this now, it will correct for that, so you can use wider lenses and still get very good performance. Now, there is a small crop when you do this, but if you plan to use ultra-wides, I think this is definitely worth it, and it's cool to have the option. With this enabled, I'd say it's some of the most stable handheld footage I've gotten out of any camera. And if you put it on the Boost IS mode, it is almost like shooting with a tripod if you've got a static shot. So then what purpose does the GH6 serve? Well, it still does have some advantages. It's got that tilt slash articulating display that I really love. And the GH6 HDMI port can output raw video to an Atomos Ninja 5. We don't have that compatibility here yet. But obviously the biggest one is the fan because just like me, you know, cameras can overheat. And when I overheat, I have a delicious, mmm old-fashioned from Eau Claire Distillery, who is not a sponsor yet. We're working on that. But let's talk about overheating on the G9 II. I was very worried because there is no fan in this body. And shooting at our usual 21 degrees Celsius indoors, I was very impressed. Recording 5.8K open gate recording, it was able to shoot for an hour and 36 minutes until the battery died. Then we switched over to 4K 60p, same thing, exactly an hour and 36 minutes before the battery conked out. The only thing I could do to get this camera to overheat in room temperature is the 4K 120 recording, but even then it did 26 minutes, which is nearly three hours in actual payback at 24. I don't think many people will be shooting that way. So honestly, thermals are very good in this camera. It's not a lot of compromises compared to the GH6. Brings me to another nice thing. We've got better battery life on this than the GH6, where usually I can record just over an hour. Here I'm generally getting about an hour and a half. That's 50% better battery life, probably because there's not a fan in this thing. You know, it's funny, Panasonic dedicated so much effort to saying this is not for videographers, it's for photographers. But, you know, feature for feature, I think this is their best, most well-rounded video camera, as long as you don't need super long record times in very hot climates. Mm -hmm. And don't tell Panasonic, but I think this might be my primary video camera for shooting our show. Cheers. So for a camera that was just supposed to be for me, it turns out that Jordan and I both found things that we really enjoy about this. This seems like a solid platform. I mean, I like the new handling that's very much like the S5 II. I think the image quality has improved significantly, especially over the GH6 with that sensor. And uh, the autofocus seemed to perform really well. I enjoyed the portraits I got. Despite the ugly graphic user interface, I think it does a great job getting the eye. But the animal detect was also very impressive, not only for pets, but roosters and horses and stuff. And I think, you know, a lot of people are looking at Micro Four Thirds as a wildlife platform. I think this camera will deliver the goods that they're looking for. Now, people are obviously going to compare this against the OM System OM-1, and I think that makes sense. I mean, this gives you a little bit of a resolution advantage, though. I like the handling. I think they both are going to do a good job as wildlife cameras with that new animal detect autofocusing capability. And really, as a photographer, looking at the two platforms, there's good and bad either way. I think you could go either way, but... For video, there's no denying that this is a way better video camera. And so this is a much better hybrid camera. Jordan appreciated this more than the GH6, which is aimed directly at videographers. And so I think if you're looking for a strong hybrid camera, this G9 version 2 is absolutely worth a look. Still, I understand that this is pretty pricey camera. You can get into some entry level full frames at this price point, and so you really have to want the Micro Four Thirds platform. I enjoy it for the lens size, the ability to go travel and do adventure stuff. I think it's worth it, but you'll have to judge whether it's the right platform for you. Leave comments below. Let us know what you think about this brand new G9 II. Please subscribe to the channel. Give it a like. Let us know what you think about how we're doing. Check out our Instagram, and do also listen to our podcast. You can watch that right here on the same YouTube channel, or you can listen to it on all your favorite podcasting apps. And you know, while you're at it, why don't you rate our podcast on the apps? We would really appreciate that. Let's get those numbers up. We really like the growth that we're seeing, and it is thanks to you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon with more episodes of Petapix.